Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video we are doing muscle contraction. So this is still part of chapter 15 and I'm sure for some of you it's just like can this end already? It is a very long chapter indeed, it's very detailed but it's a chapter that is quite popular in uh, CIE exams so I encourage students to not feel disheartened by it in any way but please just try to power through and understand what needs to be done so that you can get maximum marks in your exams. If you have just found this channel, I am posting content from my classroom slides, I'm just recording them for students to be able to revise or to expose themselves to content and everything is in chronological order. Make sure you use the playlists function if you want to zoom in on a particular chapter because that is very helpful. So you don't have to flail around the whole um, channel looking for a particular chapter. You can just go to the playlist and you will find everything that you need there. So when I discuss this chapter with my students, we start off with the different types of muscles. Cardiac muscle is basically the muscle that makes up the heart, but it is also often referred to as myogenic muscle. What this means is that myogenic muscles don't need any impulses to contract, they contract on their own. So your heart doesn't contract in response to an impulse, it just keeps contracting on its own, so it is myogenic. You also have smooth muscle and smooth muscles make up things like the walls of the intestines or the stomach um, and so smooth muscle because it's needed for the easy movement of digested food particles or even excreta and so on. Then you have the skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles are the muscles that are attached to the skeleton and they are also called striated muscles. Striated muscles, also just when you look at them, you can see that they seem to have like layers, like if you eat a piece of chicken, um, that is if you're not a vegetarian or a vegan, you will find that, you know, they have like layers in the muscles um, that you can see there. And striated muscles are also called neurogenic muscles, so neurogenic muscles, and what that simply means is that they contract in response to nerve impulses, so they always have to receive an impulse in order to contract, all right? Um, and it can be a voluntary or an involuntary one, so you can decide to go to the gym, for example, to lift some weights, in which case that is voluntary, or you can see um, something charging towards you and you decide to run. Um, that would be an involuntary response. But the point is that impulses cause the skeletal muscles to contract. And for this video, we are going to be looking only at the skeletal muscles and how they contract. So what do they look like when you actually zoom in to muscles? What do muscles look like? This is typically what the structure of a muscle fiber is. And um, from one Z disc, so these are called Z discs. You can actually tell from the fact that they're all zigzag over there. Um, from one Z disc to the next, we call that a sarcomere. Okay, so a sarcomere is basically like a, a section of a muscle. The cell membrane of a muscle cell is called the sarcolemma. The cytoplasm is called the sarcoplasm over there. And the endoplasmic reticulum is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Basically, what this means, in case you haven't noticed, is that when you're discussing muscles, the word sarco is very, very important. The membranes of the sarcoplasmic reticulum have what we call the calcium pumps. Um, and these are pumps that sort of pump um, calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you will see why this is important when we start to discuss the actual contraction process. It's also important for you to know that the sarcoplasm, which is the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, has a large number of mitochondria. And these mitochondria are important, especially when we are doing muscle contractions. So again, this is just a zoomed in version of the structure. But what I want you to really take note of here, which is really what is most important, is what are these two filaments called the thin filament over here and the thick filament over here. So with the thick filament here, we call it, it's made up of what we call myosin. Okay, the thick filament is the red one, the red horizontal lines. And the thin filament are the blue lines and they are made up of actin. There. These are important for you to know. As a matter of fact, these are the most important things for you to know when it comes to muscle contraction. So again, just like I said, the thick filaments are made up of myosin, while the thin filaments are made up of actin. Myosin is a fibrous protein, but it has a globular head, and actin is a globular protein. 
but I'm sure you, you probably know that if you've watched the videos on proteins from chapter two. If you haven't, please just take a while to go and do so. It would be very helpful for you. Um, so we have the fibrous portion of myosin that anchors it um, into what is the thick filament, and it has its globular head. Actin molecules, on the other hand, form chains. So I try as much as possible to draw this out for students on the board. So I would always say that um, let's assume that this is what um, our myosin looks like because it's a fibrous protein over there and it has globular heads. So you can just think of it as something that looks like that. OK, and then you have your actin molecules that are globular, but they form a chain. So you have a chain that's just linked to each other like that. I'm clearly not the best artist in town, but as long as you get the picture, that's what's important. All right. Now, actin molecules are not just chains. They also have what we call active binding sites on them. But we're going to zoom into that just in a little while. On actin, we also have a molecule that's twisted around it. So I think it would be best for me to draw this maybe somewhere up here where you can see. And I'm going to use a black um, pen. So again, this is our myosin over there, fibrous myosin, and it has its globular heads attached to it. I'm not going to draw a lot of them. It's just for you to get the picture. And then we have our actin. I'm going to use a green marker. Our actin molecules, they are chains like that, just attached to each other. Okay. Now on actin, which is this globular chain, it has a molecule called tropomyosin that's twisted into a thin filament. So I'm going to use purple to represent tropomyosin. So tropomyosin is sort of twisted around actin like that. Let's just have it something that looks like that. All right. So it's like a, a, a rope that's around actin. Then you also have a protein called troponin um, that's also attached to actin at intervals. So we can use, let me see, let's use a dip. Let's use red for troponin. So troponin is also sort of attached there at different intervals. OK. Cool. So that's basically what this looks like. Um, if it looks confusing, don't be afraid. I think there's a slide where I have better images from the textbook. So what would then happen now that we know what the structure is? What would happen when an impulse reaches the muscles? So remember, we're discussing the nervous system and we said that we have the receptor, which would transmit an impulse through the sensory neuron to the relay neuron. The relay neuron takes, takes it to the motor neuron and the motor neuron takes it to an effector. Most effectors are muscles. So the muscles are like the terminal points where a response is generated. So in this case, an impulse will travel till it, till it reaches the presynaptic synapse. The presynaptic synapse in this case would be the a motor neuron, okay? So it would be a presynaptic neuron, rather. It would be the motor neuron because it's the one carrying the impulse to the muscles. And the muscles will then be the postsynaptic membrane, okay? So the neurotransmitter, which is generally acetylcholine, will travel across the neuromuscular junction. So neuromuscular junction already tells you that we have a neuron, right, as a presynapse, uh, as a presynaptic neuron, and then we have the muscle as the postsynaptic membrane. So the neuron is simply sending transmitters to the muscle. And then acetylcholine will bind, and then you have depolarization of the membrane, and you have an action potential in the sacrolemma. This impulse, when it reaches the muscle, it will stimulate again the opening of calcium ion channels in the muscles, and these calcium channels are in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium will then go and bind with troponin. So remember when we just looked at the structure where we said we have myosin and we have actin and we have tropomyosin, which is like a chain around actin, and then we have troponin that's bound at regular intervals. Calcium goes and binds to troponin. What will then happen is that that would change the shape of troponin. So it basically causes troponin to change shape in a way that troponin twists out of the way and it pulls tropomyosin with it. Once it does that, you would find on actin binding sites for myosin heads. And then myosin is able to bind to actin. And that is what causes the contraction. So that's like a cross bridge and it results in contractions. So I'm going to try to draw it here because I think I don't have any words here. So let's just look at this. This is our myosin over here. I don't know why I keep making these fibers so long because I have no plans to fill up the entire thing. But let's say this is myosin 
Um, it's a filament and it has globular heads. So those are the globular heads, okay? Then let's draw actin. Actin is globular and it's just like a chain over there. So these are our actin molecules. Let me make them a bit bigger. Um, they're not irregularly sized. This is just a result of my poor drawing ability. Um, there we go. Okay, so that's our actin molecule. Now on actin, we also have what we call tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is like a thread that's just wound around actin. What tropomyosin is doing is that it is blocking the binding sites for myosin heads. So this is myosin, remember? I'm just going to write myosin M, and here is actin. On actin, we have binding sites. So I can just maybe put them there somewhere under here. And they're covered by tropomyosin. We also have troponin. So I don't know, I use a blue color for troponin. We also have troponin that's sort of attached there at regular intervals. And it's attached to uh, tropomyosin molecules, okay? So that looks a bit messy, but I think there's an image that's a lot better. So now here we go. An impulse comes and it reaches the neuromuscular junction, all right? The membrane becomes depolarized, the membrane of the muscle, and that results in calcium-gated channels opening. The calcium ions that flow into the sarcoplasm, so that's the cytoplasm of the muscle, will go and bind. So I'm going to use a black marker for that. They'll go here and they'll bind with troponin. Once they bind with troponin, they cause a change in shape in troponin. And because of that change in shape, troponin moves out of the way and pulling with it tropomyosin. So basically, it moves tropomyosin as well out of the way. And what you then reveal are the binding sites that are on actin for myosin. Once those binding sites are open, myosin will then bind to actin like that. Okay, and we call these whatever is formed, what is formed at, from that binding a cross bridge. So I'm just going to underline it here. We call that a cross bridge. Okay, so this is just continuous explanation. I'm going to erase these. I hope you understood that. Um, so when acetylcholine would bind and then you have action potential in the sacolemma. So basically just repeating what we already learned from synapses that when you have acetylcholine binding to the postsynaptic membrane, you're going to depolarize that membrane and make it generate its own action potential. In this case, the membrane is a muscle. So the action potential that's generated results in a response to whatever stimulus you are experiencing. So the impulse will then travel and stimulate the opening of the calcium ion channels. This again is just a repetition of what has already been said. So now let's look at this in um, better detail, I hope. So let's look at this. So when the muscle is relaxed, let's just look here. I'm just going to use my red pen over here. So look at this. Over here, we have our thick filament. Can you see that? This dark brown one here. And here we have our thin filament. And you can see that our thin filament is made of little round balls. All right. And we have our thick filament over there. And it has like these heads that are protruding from it. Those are the globular heads. And this is the fibrous body. Now, when the muscle is relaxed, okay, myosin is not bound to actin at all when your muscles are relaxed. So when you're chilling, you're sleeping, you're not doing anything hectic, your muscles are relaxed. So there's no binding between myosin and actin. And the reason for this is because tropomyosin and troponin, these are these two over here. So this is tropomyosin, as you can see, and that's troponin over there, are bound to actin. So this is actin. You can see it's made up of balls over there. They are bound to actin. And by binding to actin, they are covering the binding site between actin and myosin, okay? When muscle contraction starts, troponin and tropomyosin will change shape. And we know that what causes them to change shape is the fact that calcium ions bind to troponin. And when they bind to troponin, they change the shape of troponin. And as a result of that, troponin will move tropomyosin out of the way to expose the binding sites on actin. Once those binding sites are revealed, myosin heads will then attach to actin and that is what we call a cross bridge, all right? Now, when that cross bridge is formed, the myosin heads will actually pull the actin fibers 
closer to the center of the muscle and that is what we call the contraction so if you notice for example if you go to the gym and you're lifting weights if you're doing your biceps you're actually shortening the muscles when you're doing that and that is how they start to bulge and become bigger right uh, because you're shortening them you're making them shorter rather than longer and so this is what causes um, the contraction that myosin heads will tilt and we call this the sliding filament theory Okay, so sliding filament theory that myosin, after binding to actin, pulls the actin fibers towards each other. So you can see also here from the arrow that is being shown here that the actin molecules after myosin binds to them are pulled towards the center of the muscle. Then we have ATP hydrolysis, whereby ATP um, would basically be hydrolyzed, it would be broken down in the muscle, and that causes the release of myosin um, from actin. So it then just detaches when ATP goes and it binds to it. And then that causes myosin heads to say, oh, okay, the contraction has happened. And then they go back and then they continue again. So contraction is not something that is sustained. It's something that happens and then the muscles relax and then it contracts again and the muscles relax. And that goes on and on and on. So that is muscle contraction in a nutshell. If you found this confusing, just post a question in the comments and I will try to put notes um, for you in the description that might be helpful. But that's if I see a question in the comments. If I don't, I will just assume that you, you understand. Now, where does the energy for muscle contraction come from? Our muscles use a lot of ATP um, and we have ATP in our resting muscle fiber, but that's ATP we use up very quickly once contraction begins. So our energy for muscle contraction comes from aerobic respiration. And if aerobic respiration is not fast enough, just like we discussed in respiration, then the human muscle will undergo lactic fermentation. Always remember, I often feel the need to say this to students, that lactic fermentation is not the same as alcoholic fermentation. Humans do not conduct alcoholic fermentation. Only an, um, microorganisms, and in some cases rice, um, would do that. We conduct lactic fermentation. The muscles also make ATP from a compound called creatine phosphate, and it's usually stored in the cytoplasm of the muscle, and it's the immediate source of ATP for the muscles. Um, so it basically loses a phosphate group, um, creatine phosphate loses a phosphate group, and then we have creatine only. That phosphate group is added to ADP to make ATP, and so as a result of that, we can get energy for muscle contraction. This is the end of muscle contraction. That's it in a nutshell. And I hope that you understood it. Again, if you don't, please post a question in the comments and I promise to get back to you. But from here on, we are going to hormonal coordination where we discuss the menstrual cycle and our hormones help with the coordination of the menstrual cycle. Until then, have a good time. Enjoy.